I'm happy this morning. I'm glad because we have a chance to do church, and I didn't think we were going to get to do church this week. So we uh, we threw it together, and we're here. We're here for church this morning. We're here to celebrate uh, God's gift to us through Jesus Christ, the gift of grace, uh, the salvation that we have, the forgiveness that we have, uh, the righteous covering that he's given us uh, through Christ's work at the cross. We're here to celebrate all of those things this morning. And uh, before we get started, I just want to I, I get into a word of prayer and then get into this message because I think this message is going to uh, open your eyes to some things um, this week. I think, I think it's going to change your perspective maybe a little bit. Uh, let's just pray real quick. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning to, uh, to think about uh, what you've done for us, what Jesus has done for us through the cross. Um, the forgiveness that we have, the shed blood that washes away our sins, the righteousness that's been given to us, the free gift of salvation uh, that you uh, put before us that we can lay hold of, that we can hold on to, and that we can claim as our very own God. I thank you for that this morning. I just pray that your spirit would take over this message, uh, that you would speak through me this morning, through your words, uh, through your scriptures, uh, that Jesus would be revealed in all of this. God, that is the the name of the game for us here uh, is that Jesus would be revealed. So show us Christ this morning in this message. In his name we pray. Amen. So this morning's message is called, A Man After God's Own Heart. And I probably should have parenthetically put in there, or woman. A man or woman after God's own heart. Our main text is going to be from 1 Samuel 30, verses 1 through 8. You know we're going to be all over the Bible anyway. But I, I think this is, this is what God called David. This is how God referred to David. And I think that we need, we need to, this is what we're going to do this morning. We're going to put this in perspective because I think sometimes we want to be a man or a woman after God's own heart. And we, we think that that is uh, dependent on our abilities to uh, live right and, and do right and act right. And then yet we have David who, who slept around on his wife who slept with another man's wife, who had that man's wife killed at the front line of battle. So he, he's an adulterer and a murderer. And, and so, you know, so and by this is a man after God's own heart. But he violated the commandments. And then David was elevated to the status of king. And, and David saw blessings in his kingdom. And so I think that we, we can't really say that a man or a woman after God's own heart is someone who... who uh, uh, Hungers and thirsts for right living, uh, because that's not what Scripture says. The Bible says that uh, hungers and thirsts for righteousness, and we're talking about God's righteousness. See, there's a difference there, and I'm already getting into it. But it, it's not so much about what you do, it's about what you're after. See, he was a man after God's own heart. He wasn't a man after uh, living right. He wasn't a man after uh, being good. He wasn't a man after riches or success. He, he actually he was a man after God's own heart. And God calls him this before we get to where we see David actually going after God's heart. It's a very interesting thing. Let's open up. Acts 13, 22. That's where I want to start today because, hey, they're quoting the Old Testament. And when he had removed him, this is he, God. When he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king. To whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. Is that true? I mean, David sinned, right? David, David sinned. That's not God's will. David slept with another man's wife. That's certainly not God's will. David killed that man, that wife, that girl's husband. Well, that's certainly not God's will. But here God says there's a man that will do all my will. He will do all the things that I have for him in life. Yeah, he's going to mess up. He's going to make mistakes. He's going to screw up along the way. But the reality is David is a man who's seeking after my heart. And because he is a man who is seeking after my heart, he will do all of the things that I have planned for him, regardless of the mistakes he makes along the way, regardless of the terrible decision that he makes along the way. David will still do my will because he is seeking after my own heart. That's interesting. Because today, where we are, and we don't, if we're not seeking after God's heart, if, if we're, not, we're not like David, if we're not seeking after God's heart, then we can't do His will. We can't live into His will. But if you are seeking God's own heart, if you are like David, a man or a woman like David, just seeking after the heart of God, you will do His will regardless of what you've done in your life. 
That's part of the, the grace uh, misunderstanding. That's part of the, 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 un, the inability for us to conceive that, that God could take, uh, uh, like the song said, a, a dirty sinner like, like you and me and do all of these things through us, even though we still do all these stupid things. It, it's an amazing mystery. It's the gospel. It's, it's because of what Jesus has done. It's because of, of his blood and his righteousness that God is able to work his will in your life even though you're not living in the will of God according to the things that you're doing that are contrary to his standards. that make a lot of sense? I hope so. I see a lot of pens going, so it's got to mean something. That's got to be good news. Well, it's 1 Samuel 13, 14. That's what this is from right here, just in case you're wondering. It says, but now your kingdom shall continue. The Lord has sought, shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people. Because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. See, God is, God is, is speaking to the prophet, and he's saying, look, old king, you're done. All right, the, the God's through with you because you aren't seeking God. You aren't seeking God's heart. You aren't after God's heart. You know what? God's going to raise up this new king, and he's going to command the people. You know why? Because he is after God's heart. He is seeking God's heart. And, and uh, the greatest thing about this is this is before David literally seeks the heart of God. We're going to get into that. So let, let's bump, bump to Samuel 30, 1 Samuel 30, because that's where we see it. See, God, God sees future and past all like it's right now. He stands outside of time, and he looks into time. So that's how God can be such a good prophet through his people. That's how God can tell you what's going to happen before it happens, because he's the only one who knows it's going to happen, because to God it already happened. Makes a lot of sense, right? That's why God can create the earth at the beginning of time, knowing full well that later on his son was going to die and that man was going to sin. And so he still created man because he knew that Jesus was going to die to cover their sin. That's why God can do all these things. That's, that's the mystery of predestination and, and all those kind of things. That's wrapped up right there. And it's, it's hard to comprehend, but once your eyes are open to it, you can fully comprehend it. And it's not really that hard after all. But anyway, back to 1 Samuel 30. Now, it, it happens. See, Maggie's laughing already because she's like, this was not a church week. And now Gary's preaching and, and it's an off Sunday. But that's okay. Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziglag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag, attacked Ziglag, and burned it with fire. And that's bad news. And then, then taken captive the women and those who were there from small to great. But they didn't kill anybody. But they carried them away and went their way. I'm just going to flow right through this right now. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was, burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters have been taken captive. Man, it's got me frustrated. Come back to the city, and it's been burned down because the Amalekites came, and they, they took all your people. They took your wives and your kids. Man, it's got me frustrated for David. He took somebody else's wife, so I guess that was a little rough karma coming back. I don't know. But so he comes back, and, and his daughters and, and their sons and their wives have been taken. And then David... He said, and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and they wept. Yeah, sure they did. Until they had no more power to weep. They cried their eyes out. They cried until there were no more tears. They let their feelings and their frustrations come before the Lord. They shouted out. They didn't have a priest there with them. They just shouted out to God. And they cried and they wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives, I'm going to butcher their names because I'm not, just terrible. I know I'm um, the judge. Jezreelites, Tess, and Abigail, I got that one. The widow of Nabal, the Carmelite, had been taken captive. So he had two wives, and they're both gone too. Now, David was greatly distressed. This is interesting. David's their leader. And he's, he, he comes back, and this is all going on. And then the city's been burned with fire. And the, the families are gone. And, and the people are upset. David is upset. Everybody's frustrated and confused and doesn't know what's happening. And <coughs> David was greatly distressed because the people spoke of stoning him. Like, well, let's get rid of David, man. It's got to be David's fault. He's in charge, so it's got to be his fault. We always blame the leader, don't we? They're like, it's, all, it's always somebody else's fault. Because the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself. In the Lord his God. And I, I love this right here. In the Lord his God. Because 
And in, if you got one of, one of the Bibles that translates this right, the word L-O-R-D should be in all capital letters. If, you, if your Bible has the word L-O-R-D written in there in all capital letters, that translates to Yahweh in Hebrew. That's, that's Jesus. When, when it says that he's, David strengthened himself in the Lord, his God, that's Jesus, his Elohim. That's David found strength in his Savior, his Savior, Jesus Christ. David didn't know his name. David didn't know that he was going to die. He didn't know that, you know, that was going to be Jesus. But David found strength in the name of God, that is, Lord, my Savior, my Deliverer, my Protector, my Provider, my Shield. He found his strength in that name. He didn't find his strength in Lord, my Commander, in Lord, my 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 dictator and Lord, my lawgiver. He didn't find his strength in that. Even though that's the same God, he found his strength in the name of salvation. There's a very interesting thing that we're getting into here. David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Then David said to Abiathar the priest, Amalek's son, please bring the ephod here to me. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. Okay? This right here. So they go out of this right. This right here is where David seeks the heart of God. You see, in the Old Testament, under the old law, when, when the priest had his, had his had, the high priest had garments that he wore, and he wore this thing called an ephod that was connected to, to these stones on top of his shoulders, and then there were these gold chains, and he had his robes and all this other stuff on, and then this ephod thing that all hung together and was all tied together, and on the breastplate of this, which is the whole thing, the ephod here to me, were, were written, there were 12 stones on it, for each one, individual, all different rare stones, expensive, precious gems, all individual for each name of a tribe of Israel. Okay, so they had the 12 stones on his chest. Up here on top were black stones, six names carved into this one, and six names carved into this one. So all one thing. It's a very symbolic thing. It's a picture of the priest carrying the names of the tribes of Israel on his shoulders. He's bearing them up on his shoulders before the Lord. And he's carrying their names all individual. You see, together we're all carried together on God's shoulders. We can all rest together on God's shoulders. But individually, one by one, we are all written on God's heart in our own unique little way. Some of us uh, purple and some of us green and some of us amethyst and some of us emerald. That's purple and green stones. Just so that worked out good, didn't it? Because I don't know any other ones. Diamonds and everything, rubies and everything else on there, okay? So, you, you understand it, right? So, David says, bring me the ephod. And so David inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I pursue this truth? Shall I take them? You see, what David is doing, the priest, the high priest, is a representative to the people of God. And he's a representative to God for the people under the Old Covenant. David lives under the Old Covenant. He knows that. But I think it's really interesting that David didn't ask for the priest. You see what, David, what happened in the Bible? David said, bring me the ephod. Bring me what goes on the priest. But don't bring me the priest. I don't want him. That's not the priest I'm looking for. I'm looking for a different priest who wears the same garments, but he's different. I'm looking for a priest that I can look into his heart and I can see what's on his mind. What David was doing was saying, give me the royal garments of the priest. Give me the high priest's clothing, but I will put God in the place of the high priest. David was looking for Jesus is what he was doing. He was saying, bring me the ephod and I will make God be inside it. I will seek God. You see, he was going after God's heart. He was going after Jesus. He, he may not have been aware of it. it. This may have just been his spirit moving him. But David, when God said, I've chosen a man who is seeking after my heart. What God saw was David in Samuel 30, 1 Samuel 30, saying, bring me the ephod. I want to inquire of the Lord. You see, David was seeking Jesus. He wasn't seeking 
right living. And you see, the way this was worn was the priest would put it on and it would, it would hang over his chest. We know what's inside your chest. Your heart is inside your chest. So David would have to look intently at the ephod over the chest of his high priest. And we have a new high priest today. We have a priest according to a new order. We have a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. We have a great high priest in Jesus Christ. The symbolism is incredible here. The, the, the message is incredible here. It's not David. David zoomed in his focus. You want to be a man or a woman of God? Stop looking at the turmoil. Stop looking at the fire in the city. Stop looking at the fact that this has been taken away, and that is gone, and this is gone, and this might go, and these people are pissed off at you, and they want to stone you. Stop looking at all those things. you got to zero in your focus. you got to get it down to the heart of God. you got to reposition yourself so that you're looking at Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ, David, strengthened himself in the Lord. Remember, David found his strength and his salvation in Jesus. He looked to God as his Savior, as his deliverer, as his provider, as his question answerer. He looked at God for all of those things. He said, bring me the ephod. I want a high priest who will wear this, but I don't want a man high priest. Just bring me the ephod, and I'll put God inside the ephod. I'm going to make a new device. It's going to be called the ephod instead of the iPod. We'll just have the ephod. <laughs> So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? Now, this is just a little history for you. In the Old Testament, when the priest wore the, the, the garments, they wore the ephod, and wore all those things, they, there were these things called the Urim and the Thurim that, that the Bible talks about, the, the lights and the perfections. And what they would do is they would go to the priest, and they would look at the priest, and he had the names that are all written on here, and, and in individual stones, and, and they would say, um, I need to know uh, what God wants us to do right now. And they wouldn't look at the priest, they'd look at, this, at, the, at the ephod. And the, the light would, would hit it in and, and just the right way and show the perfect will of God and spell out, because all the names were written on there, so there were letters, and it would spell out <laughs> to them what needed to happen. And so that the lights and the perfections were there. So what David is saying is, bring me that so I can look at it and so I can see what God says to me. I want to see how the light hits it today and what it says. And so he answered him. God answered him. Isn't that amazing? He didn't need the priest there. All he needed was the ephod so he could look at it, so he could zero his focus in on, what, on the heart of God, on, on Jesus. Let's just put it that way. And God answered him and said, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them, and without fail, recover just a little bit of what you have lost. No, no, no. That's not what God says. God is in the business of full restoration. He's not in the business of partial restoration. You're not getting half back, okay? He said, pursue them because you shall surely overtake them and without fail. Without fail. I love that. We need to just underline that. Uh, let's get t-shirts made that said without fail because when God provides for you, it's without fail. He can't fail. It's not going to happen. So without fail, recover all. Recover it all. Okay, that's the message. That David gets. So he goes out, man. He, go, he goes out and he takes like 600 guys with him. And then they come to this water area and he, and he loses. Some guys are tired. And so he goes out with 400 guys from there. And he ends up recovering everything. He ends up slaying some people, uh, winning the battle, and bringing everything back home. And through all of this, God makes David look awesome. And that, I think that's just a bonus of God's grace. You know, like... We've got, we've got Jesus, and we focus our, when you focus, you know, I'm going to look straight into the heart of God. I'm just going to focus my life on Jesus. I don't care about all this other stuff. I don't care what's going on in the world. I don't care about the problems out here. I, I really don't even care who gets elected president because that's not my president. I'm an ambassador here anyway. I don't even belong here. But I don't care about that. I'm not worried about these things. I don't care about HP2 or HP1 or whatever it's going to be. I don't, I'm not worried about all of these things. I'm just going to zero my focus in on Jesus. And I'm not going to worry about my unrighteous deeds anymore because I'm covered with the blood of Christ. And I'm wearing his righteousness now because God made him sin so that I can be made righteous. And so we, we continue to focus on Jesus. And what, what does the Bible tell us? The Bible says in Corinthians that when, when we look at him, when we focus on Jesus, 
The Spirit of God transforms us into His image anyway. Maybe that's what was happening with David right here. He was focusing in on the heart of God. He was, he was looking at this ephod to see what God said to him. He was, he was putting it on the priest that wasn't even there. He was holding it up and saying, God, fill the ephod for me. I want you to be my high priest. I want the Lord to be my high priest and show me what I need to do. I don't want to bring another high priest down here. I don't want to bring a flawed man in and put this ephod on him. I want you to wear this ephod for me, God. I want you to show me the way, God. That is a man after God's own heart. You see, it wasn't about his righteous deeds or his unrighteous deeds. It wasn't about what he did with Bathsheba. It wasn't about how he killed Uriah. It was about how he focused his, his perception and his intent on God's will and looking at the heart of God and how he longed for Jesus to be his deliverer. That's what it's like to be a man or a woman of God. It's not about living right. I mean, that's going to happen. Don't get me wrong. When you focus on God, He's going to transform you into a new person. He's going to change you by the Spirit. Painlessly and effortlessly, I might add, He will transform you into His image. It's His work. Don't step on God's toes. Let Him do His job. Your job is to look at Jesus, to seek Jesus, to, to focus on His righteousness that's been given to you through the cross, to, to allow Him to be your high priest, to allow Him to make intercession on your behalf to God. To allow him to save you from the turmoil and the trouble that's going on. Your job is to simply look at Jesus and strengthen yourself in his name. And let God do all the work around you. Let God make the people who want to stone you go away. Let God show them that you are his beloved. And you are blessed because of the work of Jesus Christ. Let God do the work. You just receive the blessing. That's a good life. I like being a Christian. It's fun. <laughs> so, so David is looking for a high priest. And he takes this ephod. And he says, I want God to be my high priest. And I love that he did that. Because in the New Testament, in the Hebrews, we see that we have a high priest. And it's Jesus. We see that Jesus filled the role on behalf. Let's go. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness. Even though he is fully God, Jesus Christ was fully man. Okay, so he understands what you're going through. He understands what you've seen. He understands what you struggle with. He understands what you feel. He understands your emotions. Jesus wept in the tomb of Lazarus. Jesus got mad at the Pharisees. He understands anger. He understands worry. He understands fear. He understands aggression. He understands sadness. He understands all of those things. He felt all of those things, but and he was tempted, and all points tempted as we are. Yet, Without sin, he didn't sin in any of those things. He felt those things, but he didn't fall victim to sin. He didn't lose faith in God. He slept in a boat that was in the middle of a storm while the disciples lost faith. Jesus slept. Why? Because he didn't sin. He knew that there was a storm out there. He's not an idiot. He's God. But he didn't sin and lose faith and think this boat is going to sink. He knew, I am Jesus Christ, the very Son of God. This boat is not going to sink because I'm on it. If you're on Jesus' boat, it can't sink. That's good news, right? You might be like Peter, freaking out. Peter, get up, Jesus! Come on! The boat is rocking. The waves are out there. Jesus is like, Peter, I'm on a boat. The boat ain't going to sink while I'm on it. It's not going to happen. All right? But that's not what Jesus said. I love that Jesus didn't yell at Peter. He wasn't like, Peter, you stupid! Oh, man! Oh, my me! What am I going to do with you? No, Jesus got up and went outside, and he was like... Wind and waves stop. Peter, why don't you believe in me? Like, you really should. I mean, come on. You know what? That's modern day Jesus. Anyway, let's go on to the next verse. Let us therefore come boldly. Do you think it was bold of David to say, bring me the ephod? Forget the high priest, just bring me the ephod. That wasn't even David's position. Like, David had no, no position with the high priest. He said, just bring me the ephod. Go, go take the priest's garment and bring it to me. That's bold. 
to the throne of grace. Why? Because David, even though he was a man under law, lived his life based on God's grace. There's no argument for that in the Bible. The amount of times that David screws up and still manages to go forward. He's like Abraham. He kept screwing up and still managed to go forward. God continued to bless him because David saw after the heart of God. David saw Jesus Christ. He wasn't trying to be justified based on who he was. He was trying to be justified based on who God is. Big difference in that. So he came. David came boldly to the throne of grace. I believe that this day, when David saw the people ready to stone him, and when he saw his city burned down, and when he saw his sons and his daughters and the people all taken away captive, I believe that David came boldly before the throne of God's grace. He said, bring me the ephod. I'm going to have a, a sit down with God. And he, he walked in to, to God, and he said, God, you're, going to, you're about to tell me what we're going to do. That's kind of how he went to God. It was kind of his attitude was, I'm going to God, and God's going to give me some answers. And you know why? Because I took the ephod, and he's got, God speaks through the ephod, and I'm just going to bring the ephod here. And I'm going to make God get the ephod, and then he's going to give me the answers that I want to hear. That's pretty bold. That's pretty brazen on David's part. Sometimes you got to go to God and just let him know how you feel. Listen, if you sin in the process, you have a high priest who's living to make intercession on your behalf. I'm not telling you to go cuss God out on a regular basis, but sometimes you've got to go to God and just... We're supposed to have a relationship with God. We're supposed to have a relationship with Jesus. But I think a lot of times we look at this relationship as a boss-employee uh, kind of status. Like, there are certain things that you don't say to your boss or... You shouldn't say to your boss. Some people just say them anyway. But though that's not how your relationship with God is supposed to work. God wants to know what's on your mind. He wants to know what's what's in your heart. He wants to know what, what hurts you, what angers you. He already knows. He wants you to say it to him. God is like in a marriage with you, okay? If you always hide your feelings from your spouse, how are they ever going to know how to help you out? How are they ever going to know how, how, well, today might be a good day to go hide in the closet because I don't want to be around. They're not going to know that if you're always hiding stuff from them, okay? So God wants you to do that. So come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. If you are in a time of need, that is the appropriate time to go to God and seek Jesus, okay? Go to God. <laughs> That's what David was in a time of need. He needed to get his people back. He needed to not get rocks thrown at him. Okay? He needed a lot of help from God right now. He went boldly to God's throne. He said, God, give me some answers. I want to know what should I do. I want to know today. I want to know right now, God, what should I do? And God said, David, you're just looking at the high priest Jesus. Go get him, man. Jesus is going to go with you. I'm going with you, David. I'm your Savior and your Deliverer. Go get him. I guarantee you without fail, you will recover everything that was taken from you, David. Go get it. This is the same message today. Listen, guys, the devil has stolen some junk out of your life. He's stolen some happiness from you. He's stolen uh, some time from you. He's stolen some help from you. He's stolen some family from you. He's stolen all those things. Listen, you got to go to God. you got to get boldly before the throne of grace, and you got to zero in your focus on Jesus Christ. You're going to be like, I am looking at Jesus, God. I find my strength in Jesus, God. What do you want me to do? And God's going to say, without fail, recover it all. The devil has no authority over you anymore. I have defeated him through the perfect work of Jesus Christ. Satan doesn't have the authority to take your family. Satan doesn't have the authority to take your marriage. He doesn't have the authority to take your health or your provision or your finances. The devil doesn't have the authority over you anymore, just like he's a Malachite. They don't have the authority to do this to you, David. Go get back what they took from you. I'm going with you. I am your Lord and your deliverer. I will be there right by your side. I will give you credit for winning the battle, but I will fight it for you. Man, that's the message of God's grace. That's what we have through that sacrifice. That's what we have in the bread and the wine. That's what we have every day when we wake up. We have a high priest who in all points was tempted but never sinned. And he sits forever at the right hand of God, living to make intercession on our behalf, living to speak up for us. He makes intercession to God for us, and he makes intercession to the world on our behalf. He is our great high priest. Let us come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. To be a man or a woman of God, you simply have to look at Jesus. It's not about anything more 
or anything less. That's it and that's all. It's just that simple. Look at Jesus. David was a man after God's own heart because he sought God through the high priest that wasn't wearing the ephod. David just sought Jesus. He looked at the heart of God and said, I want to know what's on your mind. And if we get into the Bible and we see Jesus, we can see his will, we can see his heart, we can see what's on his mind. I love when, when Jesus was having the Last Supper and, and they, they were all there. John, the one he loved, it's not because he loved him more. John just wrote it down a lot. John was like, Jesus loved me. Jesus, he, I think John wrote that song. Let's be honest with you. Yeah, he might he wants that. But he, John was like, I'm John, the disciple that Jesus loved. He just named himself that. We should all do that. But anyway, John, who continually boasted about the love of Christ, was sitting there next to him. And he was, he was laying back on Jesus, the Bible says. He was reclined on Jesus' bosom, his chest. He was laying on the high priest's ephod. He was chilling out with Jesus. And Jesus is like, you know, one of y'all is going to betray me. And the rest of them are freaking out. They're like, is it me? Oh my gosh, is it me? <laughs> Who's going to do it? Is it me? I don't know if it's me. And John, John's question is, is it one of them? <laughs> Which one of them? <laughs> <laughs> it's very interesting. That's not exactly what he's saying. He's like, Who's going to be Jesus? John wasn't concerned with whether or not it was going to be him. He saw what Jesus knew. He wasn't standing up and saying, is it going to be me? He was saying, who's it going to be? He knew because he was close. He was listening to what Jesus had to say. If we look at the New Testament, we see all the times that Jesus goes out and he, he heals the sick. He heals the blind. He feeds the hungry. He restores the broken. He gives life to the dead. We see all of these things. That's the heart of God. When you seek Jesus, you see the heart of God. You see the provision. You see what God's will is. You see, God's will is that you would seek Jesus and receive what he wills for your life, which is an abundant life through the finished work of Jesus Christ. See, to be a man or a woman after the heart of God, you just need to look at Jesus. You just need to seek him and just look for his face. Seek his face righteousness and all these things will be added to you seek i love that seek first the kingdom of god we talked about that to jesus and his righteousness and all of these things provision health safety security longevity happiness joy peace prosperity all of these things will be added to you just focus on jesus that's what david did that's what we're going to do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the chance to talk about your heart today. I just, uh, I pray that as we continue to, to zero in our focus on Jesus Christ, that you would continue to uh, display your will uh, for abundant life in our lives, God. That we would be able to receive the abundance that you have for us. That we would be able to use it uh, for your glory. That we would be able to show the world that this is the true message. This is the true gospel. This is what grace is all about, that we can receive your love, your forgiveness, your provision, your blessings, your security, your safety, your health, all of these things through Jesus Christ. And all we need to do is look at Jesus. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to look at Jesus today. We just ask that you would bless each and every one of us as we go out from here in our weeks to come. In Jesus' name, amen.